What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. John, what was that? Well, you got horses in the in the studio. Well, you know I'm a oh, drummer, no, a drum. so I'm always drumming. <laughs> no, but I am trying to replicate your carbon footprint. Oh, oh, oh! Boy. I think it's pretty heavy. I think that is pretty heavy. Hey, Larry Rifkin and John Krofsik here on America Trends podcast, and we pay a lot of attention to the environment. And I've got to tell you that uh, this book came to my attention, a gentleman who works for NASA, and I thought it was fascinating. The book is called Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. And it's not rocket science. Well, he does some rocket science, (laughs) but not here on this program. No, he's uh, actually, it's really a brilliant book about how you have to start living a lower carbon lifestyle today. And Peter Kalmus is not a scientist who just uh, talks the talk. He's walking the walk. And John, he has reduced, and he can measure this stuff because he's really smart. Uh, (laughs) He's reduced his carbon footprint. That's easy for me to say. He's reduced his carbon footprint by 90%. That's amazing. Now think about that. That's amazing. Now, where do you think your carbon footprint is most readily measured and seen and most effective? Well, in terms of- I, I think uh, heating and uh, caught my car. Yeah, earlier yeah than- I think your car they, much more probably. so. So obviously now he's taking a bicycle to work. Right. And I understand that that's not something that everybody can do. But he is an atmospheric scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's got a Ph.D. in physics from Columbia University. City. And there's a lot of heavy thunk that goes there, on there. There sure is. But he's down to one-tenth the fossil fuels of the average American. And yet he doesn't feel that he's given up anything in this process, John. In fact, he thinks it's addition by subtraction, changing his life, growing more food organically and locally, uh, eating better, and uh, being much more aware of what you're taking into your body. Because, you know, when we eat meat, do we really think about the fact that there's a carbon footprint to that? No, we don't, but uh, there's a huge, especially beef is a huge problem with a carbon footprint, how we grow meat and how we uh you know the whole farming thing is is horrible for the environment absolutely and what i like about him is that he doesn't play holier than thou he doesn't suggest oh look at me and look at you and look what you're doing as opposed to what i'm doing because he admits that until very recently, he had not awakened to all of this. He was worried about what he saw with the climate. He changed his focus in science to study the clouds and the impact that he thinks climate change is having. And then he said, well, look, I can't just study this stuff, and I can't just objectify all of this data. I have got to learn to live it myself. So he put himself through a big change. And we're not saying... That all the listeners to America Trends podcast needs to do need to do exactly what Peter Kalmus has done. Well, I think we can do a lot of little things, though. I mean, I think uh, the LED bulbs are now becoming cheap. If you switch to those, you can save a lot of electricity. I mean, I I, I look at it from to start with from a uh, more of a, a financial. I mean, where can I save money? You know, and and still be green and and uh, you know, there's a lot of good technology out there even with the heating they got the new thermostats and stuff that uh, we can yeah we you can save nest. Yeah. do you think that this is really where it's all going to come into vogue is when you look at it from both energy the planet uh, your own health and then you look at the economy of it that this is now becoming something that i can't avoid doing because it's costing me money to avoid it I, I think that's where it's going, and, and I kind of hope it does go that way. I, you know, I, I wouldn't mind. I, I really am waiting for the point where they get the batteries right for solar so that, 
I, I would love to give the electric company the uh, finger. Uh, I got you. <laughs> Remember that, that great editorial cartoon in Connecticut years ago? And uh, it was uh, an old friend, Bob Engelhart in the Hartford Current, a wonderful car- cartoonist. And uh, he did this kind of middle finger thing uh, from the utility company to us. So you want to return the favor. That's right. I got it. I got it. Well, you know, it's interesting because I don't want you to think that you're going to be preached at in this episode. You're not. You're going to be hearing a gentleman who really has made a dramatic change in his life. And if we can make some steps along the way, he is cautioning. Don't try to do it all at once and don't think that you're a bad person because you haven't become a real green consumer. But you can make simple changes in your life that go beyond even recycling and such and you can really make an impact. It doesn't mean you have to change your entire lifestyle yet. Lots of those changes are in extra coming to our society but start being the change yeah, start thinking and that's about what he's it. trying yeah, to say I mean, you know when you when you when you're doing stuff you know start thinking about uh you know how can i do this better or more efficiently laundry you know you waste a lot of water how can i do this more efficiently I and mean, there's a lot of a lot of things you can do that are very simple and uh, yeah john shut the lights in this studio <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. i mean we can do this in the dark can't we Many people think we're in the dark most of the time. Uh, This really is fascinating. And, you know, this is also a feature documentary. The book has been adapted to to television, Being the Change. Look for it. The name is Peter Kalmus, K-A-L-M-U-S. And uh, he says he's happier. He says he's saving money, and he really wants to share all these good things with us. So let's get to him right now and talk with him on America Trends Podcast. Thanks for being with us. Well, joining us today on America Trends Podcast is uh, Peter Kalmus. And I've got to tell you, I've been waiting a long time to try to get into Peter's schedule. It's not easy to do. A very busy man. And he works as an atmospheric scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But you are speaking, I know, in terms of this podcast, on your own terms, your own volition, and not for NASA. But you've written a book called Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. And Peter, you say that there are a lot of scientists who don't really um, walk the walk. Uh, They talk about these issues, but they don't really live them. And for a period of time, you admit that perhaps you were among that number. Uh, Yeah, well, um, scientists are, you know, they're they're normal people with scientific training. So um, it'd probably be unreasonable to expect them to, as a group, to, um, you know, start walking the walk in terms of, for example, uh, drastically reducing their fossil fuel use before the you know general public does. Um, I think there are a few of us who are starting to do this because, um, as earth scientists, we are on the front lines uh, in terms of viewing what's happening uh, to the earth right now. So whether you study the oceans, whether you study ice, whether you study um, ecosystems in the biosphere, almost anywhere you look in the earth system right now, extreme weather. Um, you see the the imprint of global warming. Um, so for me personally, I, I when I when this connection became very clear to me, um, I started to feel like I just didn't want to burn fossil fuels anymore. Uh, just the same way I wouldn't want to hurt anyone uh, in any other way, because um, it just seems very clear to me now that burning fossil fuels causes harm to others. And you know, one of my deepest principles is to try to help others and not harm them. So, so yeah, so because of that, I looked uh, at my own life and tried to reduce my own use of fossil fuels any way that I could. And I know a few of my colleagues are starting to come around to that same way of looking at things. Professionally, even, you had something of an epiphany. Right. So um, uh, I got my Ph.D. in physics uh, between 2004 and 2008, um, and I started doing research with the um, LIGO collaboration, which is astrophysics, and that's looking for gravitational waves, which, as probably many of your listeners know, are ripples in the fabric of space-time. So that was really exciting. Um, but the more I started learning about global warming, um, the more I started getting distracted from astrophysics and fascinated by the Earth system. So uh, uh, Four or five years ago, I decided I had to make a change, and so I shifted my career to atmospheric science. 
And tell us about that. I mean, you're looking at the clouds in particular? Uh, yeah, so um, I, you know, I'm started a new project uh, uh, look using so I, I almost everything I do uses uh, either remote sensing data sets which are which are satellite data sets so I, I work especially with um, uh, an instrument called airs which is the atmospheric infrared sounder um, and so that that's able to get temperature profiles and uh, humidity profiles in the atmosphere as well as some other products um, and sometimes I use um, data from campaigns, you know, like, like radio sounds, weather balloons going up, radars looking up from the ground. Um, so, so most uh, everything that I do is, is using those kinds of data in one way or another. Um, I have a pretty new project uh, looking at uh, tornado genesis, so why some supercells form tornadoes and, and others don't, although we certainly haven't gotten to the point of trying to tease apart whether there's any climate change signal in there yet, at least uh, in this particular project. Um, and then kind of um, my more meat and potatoes work has to do with um, looking at uh, cloud systems over the ocean mm. in the subtropics. So these are uh, stratocumulus systems, which are very low clouds, which tend to reflect a lot of sunlight. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand like what causes them to be there, what causes them not to be there, how they transit, how they break up and transition to cumulus clouds, um, you know, as you get away from the western uh, coasts. Okay, well, make the scientific case for us, and then we'll talk about your own personal life and uh, things that you have done that perhaps uh, many of us can attempt. But make the scientific case for those who are still skeptical about climate change or global warming. All right, well, the first thing to understand is that uh, scientists have known um, the basic physics of the greenhouse effect for well over 100 years. Um, so, you know, this, this is the kind of fundamental piece of global warming, which basically says that uh, certain gases can block certain frequencies of radiation, and it so happens that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are essentially opaque to um, infrared radiation that's coming up from the atmosphere and that's coming up from the surface of the ground. Um, and some of that escapes to space, which cools the planet off and, and brings the planet into balance with the incoming sunlight. And some of that is um, intercepted by these greenhouse gases. So as we increase these greenhouse gases, we're intercepting more of that and that's you know, skewing the energy balance of the planet. So same amount of sunlight coming in, but less infrared energy going out. Um, so that physics is, you know, incredibly well nailed down. So that's the first piece. Um, the second piece is, you know, we're burning coal, we're burning natural gas, we're burning oil. We know exactly how much carbon dioxide um, burning a gallon of gas emits, you know, burning a ton of coal. We know that very well, and we can estimate how much we're burning. So we can estimate how much should be accumulating in the atmosphere, and we see about half as much accumulating in the atmosphere as you would expect just naively from how much we're emitting. Um, and we can measure that very well um, using this, you know, similar principles, um, just taking a sample of air and essentially um, shooting some radiation through it and seeing how that radiation is absorbed. You can estimate the um, concentration of CO2 and see that rising over time. Um, so, you know, that's also extremely well nailed down. Um, so about, we see about half of what we'd expect accumulating in the atmosphere, and the other half is getting absorbed by the ocean uh, and getting absorbed by the biosphere in fairly complex ways. So that's the, that's the carbon cycle. Um, and there's still a lot that we're learning about the carbon cycle. But that, the basic stuff that I just said, there's no um, doubt whatsoever about it. And you would expect, from what I just said, the planet to be warming about as we're observing it to be warming. And that observation of warming is also very nailed down. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's networks of thermometers. There's measurements of increasing ocean heat content. Um, so we see it in the ocean. We see it in ice melting all over the place. Um, we see it in uh, more extremes of heat. We see it in ecosystem shifting. So, you know, in some sense, the plants and the animals are getting the message sooner than we humans are that the climate is changing. Um, 
So what exactly is going to happen in the future, um, the size of the impacts, exactly how the impacts are going to play out, um, that is all a bit less certain than the stuff, the, the basic story that I... Well, thought. any of the weather that has been so uh, chaotic over this recent period while we're taping this podcast, is any of that emblematic of what we're talking about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's, you know, obviously there's been a huge amount of discussion about, um, you know, whether we can attribute hurricanes to global warming or not. Um, uh, I, I sometimes kind of struggle to see the controversy there because um, what's happening is, is what has been predicted to happen for a long time. Um, you know, a hurricane, weather is a statistical system, um, and it's, it's moving in ways that are, you know, weather is unpredictable more than a few days um, into the future. Uh, but climate is going to skew that statistical system uh, in a particular direction. Um, and that sort of skewing is, for example, with hurricanes, when you have warmer oceans, warmer sea surface temperatures, um, and warmer temperatures going down a little bit into the depths of the ocean, well, warm water is essentially the fuel for hurricanes. So, you know, you would expect to see an increase in um, uh, the extremes of hurricanes, the most intense hurricanes, and that's that is exactly what we're seeing. Though you say to us in your book, and you must say this as a scientist with a lot of uh, frustration, that we cannot use facts to convince people about the effects of global warming. Why is that? Uh, so um, that's a, that's a you know very hard question. Um, humans are. The human mind is a complicated place, um, I guess. And, um, you know, I, a lot of sociologists have, have been thinking about this question, um, you know, more deeply than I have. Um, from my own personal experience, uh, you know, I, I found that intellectual knowledge, so the facts of something happening, that's a fairly weak pressure on what I actually do in my daily life. So a much stronger pressure is basically just what I'm used to. And, and another strong pressure is what I see all around me. So people are driving cars. They're driving bigger cars now. They're filling up at the gas station. Um, other scientists are flying to conferences, you know, some of them, you know, maybe a dozen times a year. So there's, there's all this burning of fossil fuels, which is essentially socially rewarded. You know, you, you get, get networked and you get um, promotions. If you, know, if you fly more, people post about their vacations on social media, for example. So there's a lot of you know, normalization of burning fossil fuels. Uh, and, and all of this not even to say uh, about, like, the kind of tribalism and the really unfortunate politicization that's, that's occurred. You know, the physical processes that I was just describing, um, they don't care about our intentions. Uh, they don't, these processes don't care about our politics. Um, a, a molecule of carbon dioxide, when it meets uh, an infrared photon, it's going to do what physics tells it, it to do. It doesn't matter, you know, whether this political group, you know, believes in that process or not. Um, so in my opinion, um, this is perhaps maybe the single kind of greatest uh, human tragedy of our time, um, that something so apolitical uh, and so fact-based has, has become so hard for us to act on. Well, you wrote the book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. We're talking to Peter Kalmus, and uh, we'll talk about some of the things that you have done in your own life, and uh, they are pretty dramatic. But you say that society's business as usual, uh, that trajectory is carrying us toward disaster. Uh, at what speed do you see us moving in that direction? Are, are we speeding that process up? Are we trying to slow it down? I know a lot of people talk green and they talk about alternatives. Uh, where are we in that process of adapting or changing our own lives broadly as a society? And then we'll talk about your own uh, transformation. Well, Larry, you don't ask easy questions, do you? Um, <laughs> well, um, so uh, I, I feel personally um, that we're still at a fairly early stage in um, kind of our awareness of the problem uh, and our action collectively on the problem. Um, there's, you know, we've, we've kind of touched on the problem of people who decide that they're not going to believe in basic physics. 
Um, and I think that's been an extremely effective uh, campaign. You know, if you're a cynic, you would say that um, it's been uh, at least partly uh, a result of funding from uh, moneyed interests that don't want to see climate action. Um, but there's another problem, I think, which could potentially be even bigger, which is that people who do um, c kind of get that global warming is happening, uh, and they do think that this is real, still aren't really doing anything significant um, to kind of turn the ship around. So there's a lot of argument about you know, how we can be uh, skillful agents of collective change. Um, some, some activists would argue that uh, it's a mistake to kind of model individual change and to reduce fossil fuels in your own life because that detracts from needed systems level change. Um, so obviously with the kind of book that I wrote, I disagree with that strongly. Um, as one person, you know, as, as one, you know, animal in walking, you know, around on the street and riding my bike to work and speaking on, you know, podcast shows and writing books, there's only so much I can do. Um, one of the, I think, I, I feel that collective action comes, emerges sort of from many individuals starting to do something and for that particular action to start to become culturally resonant or culturally relevant. So I think um, it's hard for me to imagine a significant change at the collective level before a, a kind of a critical mass of individuals wake up and start really pushing for it. And once people start waking up in that way, it's kind of natural for them, I think, to start reducing fossil fuels in their own life. It's, it's kind of strange to say, hey, everyone, we need to stop burning fossil fuels uh, if you're not actually stopping, you know, reducing your own reliance on fossil fuels in your own life. Will that come from fear? I mean, some of the events that people are seeing that are wreaking all this devastation on others, will it come from hope and education, or will it come from economics? Uh, right. So you, my, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, I, I think probably one possible path toward action is that, um, you know, it seems incredibly clear to me that um, uh, climate breakdown is going to continue. We're going to see more um, disasters of the sort that we've seen recently. They'll happen with greater frequency and they'll become more severe. And more and more people will start to be affected personally or have, you know, friends or know people that are affected personally. So it'll become much harder to deny what's going on and people will start demanding action. And, and I'm hoping, part of the reason I wrote the book is I'm, I'm hoping more people will start to realize the very direct connection between burning fossil fuel and all of this stuff that's happening um, so that, you know, as more people decide to reduce their own fossil fuel use and call for systemic change to make it easier to do that, um, it'll be a little bit less kind of normal uh, to, to keep burning a lot, and it'll become a little bit less strange, seem less odd when people start making, you know, significant changes to their life. You know, not reducing at the 10% level, but maybe reducing more like the 50% level or 90% or level. Okay, we'll talk about what you've done, but Peter, John has a question well, for you. I, I have a, a, a comment, maybe more than a question, but I think Al Gore was a terrible messenger, and it, Taking global warming out of it, I, shouldn't we talk more about pollution? I think people understand pollution. If you show them pollution, they're polluting. I think they understand that more than they understand the science of global warming. Don't you think that would be a better approach? You, you know, I sometimes think that if um, uh, carbon dioxide pollution were, were visible, like if it was some kind of like, you know, neon green color coming out of our tailpipes, then perhaps we wouldn't even have this problem because... Uh, you know, a lot of people are, um, there's, a, there's a movement toward zero waste, um, and I think it focuses mostly on, you know, uh, trash that you can see. I mean, it doesn't so much focus on uh, kind of invisible carbon dioxide waste. So, um, you know, the question of how to get people to respond, which is, which is your essential question, uh, is it's a difficult one for me to answer. Um, the best I can do as a, as a scientist is to just kind of call it like I see it. And so... You know, I, I use the phrase global warming because that's, you know, a pretty accurate description of what's happening. It's just that's become so political that uh, pollution is more 
cut and you know it's cut and dry i mean if you're polluting you're polluting and that that's bad you know uh, sure i mean I, I i'm sure that a lot of people would resonate more with that kind of language um uh, there's also studies that you know say if you're if you're talking to a conservative audience you know they want uh renewable energy and clean air just as much as a um a more liberal audience does so they respond to that much better than if you talk about climate change and global warming but because unfortunately those terms uh, have become politicized you know maybe it was the messenger at the beginning as john said if it were someone like um well bill nye or if it had been uh, like the cosmos uh back in the day maybe uh, that messenger might have been able to get us uh, closer to uh, looking at this uh, as seriously as we need to you know you yourself have a lot of facts, and the facts drove you because you have that kind of mind. But what you have done is remarkable, Peter. I mean, you reduced your personal CO2 emissions uh, from 20 tons a year to under 2 tons. So you're talking about a 90% decrease. How do you measure that, and what have you done? Uh, right. So um, so how do I measure that? Um, that's, a, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do, um, especially you know if you have some background in, in science or, or math. Um, so there's a lot of information. Like I said, um, we know exactly how much uh, CO2 is emitted when you burn a gallon of gas. Uh, and we also know, you know, uh, approximately how much uh, CO2 is emitted from actually producing that gallon of gas, you know, getting it out of the ground, refining it, tra transporting it to the gas station. So that adds maybe 15% overhead to it. Um, so then if you can estimate how many gallons of gas you burn in a year, you know, voila, you've got your, um, uh, your estimate for, for, for driving, how, you know, how, how your daily driving habit is connected to global warming. Uh, so you can look at food, you know, researchers look at different diets and, and estimate uh, how much um, greenhouse gas is emitted from that. You can look at flying the same way. You can look at the, the stuff that you buy. Um, the way you heat your home or air conditioning. Exactly, Nat natural gas, you know, hot, hot water heaters. Some of that I measured uh, directly, but, you know, it's pretty easy just to look at your bill. and It'll say how many uh, therms that you use in a month um, uh, or maybe cubic yards of natural gas, and then you can just convert that to, um, uh, you know, an amount of CO2. So, so all of these estimates have error bars. Um, the error bars on, on emissions from diet are larger than on um, you know burning a gallon of gasoline, but it's it's you know when I first did this it probably took me just uh, maybe an hour and a half or two hours one night, um, and I made a little pie chart with um, you know and, and even just that little bit of research made it really clear for me this was in 2010 that flying was was about three quarters of my emissions, <laughs> and I had no idea before I made the pie chart like literally had no idea that flying was so impactful. Um, and, and also that same night, again, just after maybe an hour and a half of doing a little bit of Internet research and writing down a few numbers on, on the back of an envelope, my second biggest emissions source was from my diet. At that time, I was uh, eating probably pretty typical diet for an American with a lot of meat in it. Um, so that was part of what led me to become vegetarian. But I realized that, you know, I could put solar panels on my roof, but I used so little electricity that that would take a tiny little chunk out of my emissions. I could do lots of other things, but they would be small. But if I really wanted to kind of reduce my own emissions, I had to reduce my flying. So that was something that I focused on over a couple of years. Um, and I started replacing flying with traveling over the ground using trains, driving, you know, converted a car to run on vegetable oil. Um, back then, electric cars weren't as good or as affordable as they are now. So uh, if I was doing it right now, I might just get an electric car instead. You know, but I really enjoyed that process of um, converting my <laughs> Well, you car. enjoy this process of discovery, obviously, as a scientist, though yeah, you say yeah. that there is wisdom in doing, not just knowing. So there are a lot of people who know but don't do. You did it. Now, somebody listening might say, oh, that's good for Peter Kalmus. I mean, he can do all these things, and he can measure the impact. But what about me? What can I do? Right. Well, so if there's one message that listeners could take away from this discussion, um, I would hope that it's doing a lot of this stuff can actually make you happier and can make you have uh, a more satisfying, more fulfilling life. And I think that's doubly or triply true if you're concerned about global warming, because then it, it feels like, you know, first of all, 
when I was doing nothing before I actually started changing my life, I felt like I was kind of panicking, you know, and I was, I was just kind of exhorting people. I was like, why aren't we doing anything? We've got to do something. But I wasn't doing anything myself. And it seems really obvious in retrospect, but it took me a while <laughs> um, to realize that I was, I had this kind of desire or this principle to, to stop contributing to this problem that, you know, I was concerned about. Um, and yet I was living inconsistently and I was still contributing to it. And that sounds like the most obvious thing in the world that, well, of course, you would bring your actions into, into line with your beliefs um, and, and your principles. Um, but it took me a while to do it. And then once I started doing it, it felt really good. I think that's um, maybe a, a kind of a key to happiness is to live in a consistent way with your deeper principles because you, you just can't fool yourself. Um, and then, you know, even if you're not worried about global warming, I mean, riding a bike – you know, I don't care what your politics is, um, whether you're concerned about global warming or not. It's just a joyful thing to, to be moving down the street, basically flying down the street on your own power. It keeps you healthy. I get sick less than I did before I started riding my bike. You know, um, I'm in great shape. It keeps me relatively thin. <laughs> um, and I think it keeps me from getting depressed, too. It helps me just stay happy because there's something about being out in the open air and, you know, saying hi to the people that I passed. It's just, you know, a lot, and a lot of, I found this to be true for a lot of the changes I made. I, I feel more connected, you know, um, to the land. I, I'd never gardened before. I'd never grown fruit trees, and I really like doing both of those things, you know, and who knew? I, I probably never would have known if I, um, if, if I kind of wasn't motivated to start thinking about how food played into this predicament and trying to change how I got my food. So, you know, that's, that's the takeaway is um, I think, unfortunately, most of us feel that uh, we need fossil fuels to be happy and that if we start um, moving away from fossil fuels and using them less, that maybe that's a sacrifice and that's, you know, that's not something we want to do. We want to kind of replicate our lifestyle just as it is now. We don't want to change anything. But what I'm saying is that um, some of these changes are joyful in and of themselves. And then, again, if you're concerned about global warming, you'll be telling this new story um, which I think is deeply meaningful. Well, you're not only a scientist, but you've really become a spiritualist and uh, someone who wants to make sure we all understand that we can do something. Though you suggest that many of us who may be recycling and doing various things well, even as a green consumer, that perhaps we've been co-opted a little bit by some of the terminology and some of the marketing that's gone on. Yeah, well, first I should say that I think a lot of the best scientists from history, we're also spiritualists. Um, I, there's something deeply spiritual, in fact, just about doing science, I would say, you know, following your curiosity and finding, like, unlocking the, the miracles and the wonders of nature. It's just, to me, it's just fascinating to do that. But, um, yeah, I think that um, part of the problem with the second part of your question uh, is that um, for whatever reason, uh, uh, the environmental movement seems to have latched onto a strategy of, of maybe trying to make us feel guilty in order to change. And, you know, I, I, was, um, I, I was raised as, as, a, as a Roman Catholic, and, um, you know, so I've, I've had experience with guilt, and it doesn't really kind of motivate me to change my behavior. I think what guilt does is um, it causes us to it's, – it's, it's like pressure building up inside us. Like we, guilt means that – we're living in a way that we feel we shouldn't be living. And so we generate this thing called guilt, and it's, it's like a pressure that builds up inside us, and it needs a relief valve. Um, and, and a relief valve could be like recycling or maybe putting up solar panels. Um, but it doesn't it, – it's kind of like this rift in your mind where you're, you know that there's something inconsistent, and you kind of don't want to look directly at it. So you, you kind of do this little thing, maybe buy some carbon offsets. Um, if you start looking directly at it and, and becoming really attentive to that signal, like something's not right here, um, then you kind of undergo this joyful process of, of examination and exploration and, and self-change. But I, I don't think that that self-change can happen unless you sort of look at it directly in the face um, and kind of get to know yourself pretty well and, and start exploring. And, and, and that process is really joyful. So, um, you know, I, I think it's time to kind of rethink how we approach this, 
you know, I guess what you could call environmentalism uh, in the mainstream. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot that's joyful here uh, in, in kind of a new way of living with far less fossil fuel. You know, and as the systems start to catch up uh, to, to us as we change, it'll be possible to live without any fossil fuel at all. You know, and I, I genuinely think in a world where, you know, um, we're getting depressed and we're you know, getting addicted to screens and we feel kind of disconnected and, and frustrated and we're moving around so fast, you know, I'm not sure that this particular lifestyle that we have as it is, is really worth preserving. I, I think there's, I think we can do better than this. And I think that living with far less fossil fuel actually points in the same direction as, a, as you know, coming away from a lot of the unsatisfying parts of, of modern life that a lot of us feel frustrated with. When you stand in front of an audience today, presenting this book being The Change, Live Well, Spark a Climate Revolution, what kind of looks do you get? Because a lot of the people in that audience are the old Peter, not the new Peter. So what do you hear from them? Well, so, um, you know, a, a lot of discussion uh, during kind of like book events when I'm actually talking to people in real time revolves around flying because that's, that's one of the, I think, it surprises a lot of people the way it surprised me when I first found it out. Um, and there's a lot of people that genuinely want to make a difference on global warming, but um, they, for whatever reason, flying is a big part of their life. And, um, uh, you know, they could even see uh, they might be activists and their flying might be like a key part of their, their activism. So then they feel really torn. Um, so, so I've had that discussion with a lot of people, you know, and I, and I think travel is incredibly precious and a great thing to do. But what I'm trying to say is you actually don't need to do it with an airplane. You know, and if you do slow travel and find alternatives, uh, that process of just figuring out how else to get there can be a huge part of the adventure and a, and a huge part of the fun. Um, it's hard because, um, you know, it takes more time uh, and, and it's not the kind of the easy way to do things. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of pushing for more people to, to travel without airplanes, and I'm hoping that, that that culture will start to shift and then it will be a little bit less difficult to do that. Um, in terms of uh, people who read the book and then talked to me about it, um, it's, been, uh, it's been an overwhelmingly positive reception. People, I think people really like... Uh, the mix of um, facts, sort of surprising facts and kind of deep, deep analysis, like all the research that went into it, mixed with the optimism and, and kind of this more sort of philosophical outlook, which I think is really important and, and kind of missing in a lot of the mainstream discussion of global warming. This, this predicament that we're in is going to change everything about how we live and how we think of ourselves as a species, you know, how we think of our, our future on this earth and how we interact with the land with our food, with the water system, and with each other. You know, how, how, what does it mean to have a rich country, you know, and then a poor country which is bearing the brunt of this? So there's, it's just incredibly existential. Um, and I think it, you know, when you start to think about, you know, this, this thing that is kind of woven into almost every aspect of my life, it's causing harm to others and it's, it's causing harm to my kids. Um, that's kind of an existential thing. So. You know, I think people, you know, they like the this kind of. There's been too much kind of superficial discussion, I think, about this issue, global warming, and and, and that's part of another reason why I wrote the book was I wanted to go really deeply into some of these issues, um, and I, I felt like the audience would be ready for that, and that there was a need for that, and and I think that's been true, and a lot of people have been telling me that they're making changes. Um, you know, it took me several years to to go from the 20 tons down to the uh, less than two tons, you know, and so a lot of people, I think, are kind of taking those first steps that I started to take, and, and I hope that they keep going, um, and a lot of them are also reporting that, you know, just like me, they, they feel a lot better um, for making these changes. Well, in closing, Peter, uh, you preach patience because you recognize that there are changes that are difficult to make, but you say that you grieve for the time that's been lost in being the change. Uh, what kind of collision course are we on, and how much time do we have? Oh, uh, well, so it's not like a binary thing. Um, you know, it's here now. Uh, it's getting worse. So the sooner we can turn the ship, uh, the less catastrophic the impacts will be and the less suffering there's going to be. So um, it, the time was, you know, 30 years ago, and, and now it's all hands on deck. I, I feel like everyone who's concerned about this should use their full creativity, um, 
whatever kind of resources and talents uh, that they have, whatever kind of voice they have, whether it's in music or literature or science, whatever it is, we need people doing everything they can to turn the ship around to minimize uh, the suffering. I want to thank you for joining us today on americatrendspodcast.com. And again, if you want more of the philosophy and the science of Peter Kalmus, it's in the book, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. Thanks for being with us on America Trends Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Larry. If you like this episode, please leave us a kind rating or review. I'm on my hands and knees. Please do it on iTunes because your review is really critical for us to continue providing this podcast. And, John, I know that iTunes looks at this. They want to make certain that we have some ranking, some visibility, and that we're getting some traffic, and then they give you better positioning. Absolutely. And this way, it'll put us in the forefront so you can find us much easier ah. on, on your iPhone or or. Android, whatever you may be using. And they may even send you out an alert. So please, if you can, don't miss a single episode of America Trends Podcast. And, John, they can subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher.com. And also subscribe on our website. Oh, absolutely. We send out a little blurb, and uh, we can also take your emails there at newsletter at rifkinradio.com. That's another way to, to get us. And we do not sell or share no our spamming, lists. No nothing. Well, I don't know. Does anybody want our lists? <laughs> I don't know, but we don't do it. Good question. Even if they asked us. Even Nobody's if they asked, asked us. us. But. Right, right. And when you do subscribe, let us know on Facebook and Twitter. We're getting very active on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle on both platforms, and John, this is really easy, at Trends Podcast. That's it. That's real easy. You like that? Did yeah, you get that? I got that. Okay. I'm going to have to check it out quiz. now. I'm, I'm going to have to twit it. We want to thank you, of course, personally for subscribing. And we also would like to get some of your ideas and questions for future episodes of America Trends podcast. And that's important, too, because we're all over the map. Our interest editorially in the future, John, has no bounds. But we want to know what it is that you'd like to hear from us. If there was a segment that you'd like to see us follow up on or if there's something in depth that you'd like us to deal with, please let us know that, yeah, too. Any, yeah, we're looking at the future. There's so much we can look at. Yeah, and the topics that we've dealt with, I mean, we have gotten such incredible guests over the recent period, but they're only going to come to us if they know we've got an engaged and interactive audience. Absolutely. So it's really important that you become part of this uh, podcast in so many different ways that we're sharing with you today. You're absolutely right. We need your support and your help and your reviews. And your ideas. <laughs> and ideas. Or questions on Facebook and Twitter. And by the way, you can direct message us at Trends Podcast or using the hashtag Trends Podcast. You can also add an email address if you have a public one that you'd like us to give out. Yeah, good. And you know what? You know what? We didn't mention Ama that? Amazon. Oh, yes. We have an Amazon store. Yes. And so if you go up, you don't have to buy the things that might be highlighted at that particular time. You can buy any book, and there's some benefit that comes back Just to put us. put what you're looking at in the, in the little search engine block there, and it'll take you right to Amazon, and uh, it'll help us out. Absolutely. And it doesn't really cost you anything more because they have built that into their pricing structure. So we get a little taste. And you get more programming like this, and you get the item that you were looking for. So it Absolutely. works for all of us. It's a win-win. Absolutely. Win-win-win. Win-win-win. So for more information <laughs> on America Trends and for the latest updates on upcoming episodes, be sure to like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can find us at Trends Podcast. And again, you can find John and I here in our studio uh, performing as best we can for you. That's right. and let us certain. out. What's that? Let We're us not out. Let us out. No <laughs> one hey, listen, thank you so much for joining us today on America Trends. We'll see you next time. Uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Oh, by the way, we are posting all the time. And we're posting on Tuesdays and ah, Thursdays. Good point. So just be aware, if you're looking for new episodes, they're coming on Tuesdays and Thursdays. When you wake up, before you go out on your jog or your walk and you want to take us with you, we'll be there for you. Very good. All right. Have a great day. Fab.